Once again, thank you for joining us today. My name is Deanne Cuellar. I'm with the Institute for Local Self-Reliance, Associate Director of Community Outreach on the Community Broadband Networks team. I am joined today by my colleague, Sean Gonsalves, who leads our communications on the Community Broadband Network team. Next slide. We are going to uh, go over an overview of what we're calling broadband basics, sometimes called broadband 101. They're going to talk about this big term, a big tent term called broadband infrastructure. We're going to try to break it down into nice, smaller pieces. I'm hoping people walk away from this discussion today feeling like they are much more comfortable and confident to talk about the big broadband infrastructure term. And we'll spend the rest of the time towards the end talking about the key funding components, which is this reoccurring theme that people have a lot of questions and comments about and how that works in, um, in tandem with the Texas Digital Opportunity Plan, otherwise known as TDOP. And then we will do a reminder about the NTIA measurable objectives and Texas goals uh, to make sure that we are um, you know, burning that in your memory. Next slide. I'm gonna turn this section over to Sean and I will see you all in a little bit. Happy, happy new year, everyone. Um, so let's, I hope everyone can hear me fine. Um, let's start with dessert. <laughs> um, the three layer cake um, that makes up the state's quest for digital opportunity and how bead and boot which I, by the way, I love that acronym. I, I, I thought Louisiana has a great uh, state broadband uh, grant program named Gumbo, but Texas is right there, boy. Boot is a good one, I, th I think. Um, but at any rate, um, so we're going to look at this three-layer cake and how um, BEAD, Boot, bringing online opportunities to Texas grant programs um, fit in with um, the Texas Digital Opportunity Plan. And the really the framework is really around the three A's, and we can go to the next slide for the first A of this layer cake. Which is um, availability. This is what bead, this is what boot is wholly focused on. It's answering the question, do the physical networks exist to deliver high quality internet service? A lot of folks think that the internet just sort of flies around in the air and um, sort of magically arrives at our desktops, our laptops, our devices, when really 99% of the internet um, are wires, tubes, and data centers. And so the physical networks obviously need to be in place in order for folks to access uh, the internet. And when we talk about high quality internet service, we're talking about speed, reliability, and competition. And so some of you may be saying, well, look, if we're talking about the digital opportunity plan, which is separate from uh, BEAD and the, the states uh, administering those BEAD funds through the boot uh, grant program, why do we even you know need to know this kind of stuff? And I think the short answer is, is that it's important to have a at least a basic understanding of some of the technologies in play because they are very important in terms of, of, of uh, addressing other barriers to um, folks getting online and make, making better use of the digital opportunities that are before us. And so when we talk about high quality internet service and speed and reliability, we are talking about, well, primarily speed and reliability, meaning how fast is my connection you know, we're not going to get into different broadband speeds. It's not really necessary to know everything about the difference between speed and latency and jitter and some of those sort of technical concerns, because people at the end of the day want to make sure that when they go online, they're able to do all of the things that they need to do, that it moves quickly, that if you have to send an email, uh, if you're if you're on a, a Zoom call, the that the video isn't broken, think the things are moving slowly. And of course, reliability is fundamentally an infrastructure uh, question in terms of how how often are there outages and, and 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 things of that nature. And then of course, competition is something that doesn't get talked about a lot, but it's important. And I think most people understand that where you know where there's competition, um, various ISPs will then uh, compete 
on delivering the best speeds, the best, most reliable service, better customer service, et cetera. Those are all very important to this, uh, the, the, the first A of the cake, the, the, the bottom layer, if you will, the, the springboard um, for all, all, all else uh, that involves the Texas Digital Opportunity Plan. And one last thing that I'll just say about bead and boot is, and as well as, so at the federal level, you've got the bead program, which is the biggest bucket of, of, of funds in the uh, bipartisan infrastructure bill. That is what boot is relying on to fund the grant programs. Um, that works hand in hand with uh, the Digital Equity Act, which is the, the primary source of funds for the Texas digital opportunity planning process and the various um, grant and funding opportunities that will soon make themselves available um, to support, uh, you know, overcoming barriers to adoption. Um, and so it's, I think, extremely important to understand that even if you're not an infrastructure person or you're not all into the various aspects of the tech, the, uh, the technology, it's still very important that you that that everyone understands that both of them are designed to work hand in hand. Sean, may I say something real quick to add value to what you just said about the springboard? We it's often when someone's going to come up to you while you, all y'all are doing this work, I'm going to say, why do we keep talking about the internet access or people having internet access? I thought you're just doing devices. I thought you're you were just teaching digital skills. Is this the, when we say springboard, we, we mean it's like it's the precondition, like more than anything, like this this element of the habit, making sure the communities, whether you're rural or urban, has their infrastructure, like. It's a Sean yesterday called it the well, the chicken before the egg or the egg before the chicken. It's just it's just a constant reminder that we have to um, that we have to participate in to remind people that like they go hand in hand together. Thank you. Absolutely, absolutely. We can go to the next slide. This is the eat your vegetables part. Um, we started off with a little bit of the putting the cake out on the table, the three layer cake, and this is part of the the availability, the first A. And this is just sort of some of broadband infrastructure basics. And, and I can imagine, you know, someone saying, look, I don't really know much about network infrastructure. So what do I need to know? And how does it fit with uh, the Texas Digital Opportunity Plan? So let's just go over just a few things quickly. As I said before, almost the entire internet is made up of wires and um, tubes and data centers, et cetera. There are three primary technology, uh, there's, there's three essential um, wire technologies that are used to deliver what is referred to as last mile broadband service, DSL, cable, and fiber. Um, you don't need to know, uh, again, all of the, the, the technical aspects of the differences between the three, except for a, a couple of basic things. Say you're working with someone who has a DSL connection and they can't figure out why they can't do what they need to do online. Why can't I use Zoom? Why does it not seem to work? Why, why, why does it take you know three hours for me to download a document? It has a lot to do with DSL. It's an antiquated copper-based technology. A lot of the big um, telecom companies are abandoning those copper lines. Um, and unless you live very close to the central office, um, your DSL connection is probably not going to be delivering speeds that are even minimum speeds that are considered to be broadband. Now, cable uh, connectivity is what most Americans, particularly in urban areas, uh, get their internet through. Some, somewhere on the order of 80 to 85 million Americans uh, get internet access through their local cable provider. Um, Cable um, cable connections are generally pretty you know pretty good pr provided that the 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 it's affordable provided that it's reliable. Different companies have you know you know different rankings in terms of, of of their service, but as in terms of download speeds, cable connections typically do pretty well. On the upload side of things, which is becoming increasingly important, we're on a Zoom meeting. The video information of each of uh, 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 of me is being uploaded and being sent upstream, and so upload capacity becomes much much more important. And then, of course, there's lots of talk about fiber. The entire internet backbone globally and the long haul network within the United States is all fiber. In fact, fiber runs out pretty far, um, even when when it comes to wireless technology. And why is that the case? Is because fiber is really the 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 gold standard of internet connectivity. It has a near 
limitless capacity to transport traffic um, across the internet uh, with very little interference. Now, wireless technology is very cool. Nobody really likes wires. But even with wireless technology, it's still mostly wired. You see this picture of a cell tower here. There's fiber that will run to that cell tower and then wireless radio signals will hop from different uh, antennas to uh, you know local devices and homes and businesses and and such. Same same as the case with fixed wire uh, fixed wireless uh, um, access FWA. When you see that abbreviation, that's what it means. They're talking about fixed wireless. Fixed wireless is a great technology. It can really serve household needs provided that you've got good terrain. It works better in with flat terrain. And, and and even though fiber may be difficult to deploy in, say, mountainous areas, it turns out that wireless signals are also difficult to deploy in mountainous areas, mostly to do with line of sight issues. Of course, there's mobile cellular technology that you don't really need to know about other, other than to know that mobile um, connectivity generally isn't what households, it will not meet household needs typically. You can't use a, a cell phone to to really deal with all of the modern applications that a home internet connection would provide. Wi-Fi, of course, is the wireless sort of system within your home where you've got, you know, your router, uh, you know, the connection comes into your house, into the router, and then and then it will transmit the signal to various devices in your home. Satellite, I'm not going to say a lot about uh, geostationary, low earth orbit, I'm not going to talk much about that, but people often ask about Starlink and Starlink is is, is a, a good product if you're, say, at the top of a mountain in a very remote location or you're out on a boat, but it's pretty much reached its its capacity at, at, at present. Um, I believe in Maryland, there's an actual waiting list for people who want to get on Starlink. Um, it's, it's, it's expensive and um, is not really, um, it doesn't have the capacity or established um, to be uh, a, a solution for, you know, at scale for, for broad numbers of people, but it's certainly part of the mix. We can go to the next slide. Now, here's another part of infrastructure, the need for speed. So this is, this is also very important because it relates to um, digital opportunity planning because it can help target where our efforts should be focused primarily. So as many of you may recall from previous um, sessions where we, where we dove into this a little bit more uh, in depth, the, 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 the two categories that really break down in terms of where infrastructure uh, funding is going to be targeted, it's targeted first to what they call unserved areas, which is really strictly areas that do not have the physical infrastructure in place to deliver the minimum broadband speeds of 25 megabits per second download, three megabits per second upload. The FCC right now is in the process of, of looking at whether or not they're going to increase the speeds because many folks like myself and others in, the, in this industry have noted that the 25.3 uh, speed minimum definition is woefully inadequate for modern needs. The second uh, area of focus with bead as well as boot are underserved areas. And those are areas that have infrastructure in place, but is not are not capable of delivering uh, speeds above 100 megabits per second, 20 megabits per second uh, upload. Now, let me just make uh, an important note. Advertise speeds versus actual speeds. So, it's important for folks to understand that the federal government is measuring what is advertised by ISPs, not what end users actually get. Um, so now there's different states and different approaches uh, in terms of trying to verify that. There are speed tests that can be done. Many of you are familiar with. There's various uh, programs and softwares that you can you know, attach to devices or, or, or use to, to determine the download and upload speed and some other um, uh, quality of, of your connection. Now, there, there, there's instances where depending on the time of day you do the, 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 the speed, you may get different readings, et cetera. But there are people that are looking at ways to do this cumulatively so that you're not unfairly targeting um, ISPs. Now, we visit network operation centers, mostly fiber um, um, providers all across the country. 
And what stri strikes me is when I ask the question of about service calls, almost to every place that we visited, they also, they say something on the order of like ninety percent of the connectivity issues that they that they are dealing with or that uh, customers are calling and dealing with are actually the result of their router not being a good one. And so oftentimes, and unfortunately, the I the 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 network provider or the owner of the network often gets blamed for that. But in, in, in point of fact, in many instances, it's the actual router that could be the reason why uh, folks are not getting the actual speeds um, that they're paying for. But the bottom line though, is that no one really knows, unfortunately, you know, the precise difference between uh, advertised speeds and actual speeds. But this is the, the data set that we're using. We can go to the next slide to move on to the second A um, of our three layer cake. So again, the, 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 the availability part is the infrastructure. It's the fundamental uh, uh, physical networks that need to be in place in order to access high-speed internet for anyone. But the biggest barrier, it turns out, um, for folks who do not have home internet um, service is affordability, as you might guess. So there's this line, I think, in the movie, yeah, not I think, in the movie, The Field of Dreams, a movie that I like very much, where if you build it, he will come, or if you build it, they will come. Now, in my eyes, the, you know, the, te the Texas Digital Opportunity Plan is a, really a field of digital opportunity dreams, but it has to be grounded in reality, of course. And so it's not the case that just because the infrastructure or the service is available, that it guarantees that folks are going to use it or to get service. And so this is where the, 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 the TDOP becomes extremely important um, and why it's so important for local communities to be engaging with the state on this process. If you think this stuff is very difficult, imagine being in a state office or in a federal office and maybe not have ever visited a particular area and trying to solve these challenges. The folks who know best about these connectivity challenges are folks in the local community. Now, the Texas Digital Opportunity Plan focuses, as I'll say, on, on everything but the wires, on everything but infrastructure. And again, the biggest barrier to uh, internet access once the infrastructure in, in place is affordability. And as we like to say uh, in this space, if it's not affordable, it's not accessible. And I'm just gonna pause for a moment to tell you a little bit about the affordable connectivity program because every state is relying on the affordable connectivity program to address this affordability issue. Now that program, which was initially funded with $14.2 billion is just about out of money. It's gonna run out in April. Uh, there, there is a ACP Extension Act that is being floated in Congress as we speak, but it is anyone's guess how that will turn out. And in fact, many ISPs and even the FCC are starting to make preparations for the potential wind down of ACP. Deanne's going to talk a little bit uh, later about something specific to San Antonio, but this is an important consideration um, to think about, about how you address the affordability question if ACP should happen to go away. Um, I know this week um, the FCC has said that they're, that they're gonna put a pause on enrollment until this stuff gets sorted out. Uh, right now there's about a little over 20 million households enrolled in, the, in, in, in ACP. So this is an extremely important development that um, everyone who's concerned about these issues should be following closely. Next slide. The third and final A is about adoption. Okay, so the three layer cake, the infrastructure is the, the foundation. Affordability is sort of that connective tissue um, between infrastructure and clearing the way for digital opportunities. That also obviously includes devices. It's one thing to afford internet service. It's another thing to be able to afford the devices that you need in order to uh, you know get online. But even with infrastructure and affordability, um, addressed or taken care of, there are still a number of barriers to uh, more folks taking advantage of uh, access to high-speed internet. And that is really around digital skills 
and confidence are extremely important. And that's why the TDOP um, plan is so focused on trying to identify stakeholders, uh, barriers, uh, and issues, um, and, and, and to begin to think about setting up programs because it's gonna require programs to do digital skills training, to train digital navigators who can then be in communities and, de- and, and, and be working with folks that may uh, you know, be fearful of this technology, but may not be familiar with how to use it. Um, um, there's also issues around language and cultural specific materials. And so there's, there's barriers there that, that, that need to be looked at carefully. And then assuming that uh, the ACP will continue in some form, uh, folks need help enrolling. And so there's a big role for people in the digital opportunity space to be working with community-based organizations and state and local agencies to enroll folks in ACP. And I think fundamentally around confidence, there's going to be a need to address people's concerns around privacy and uh, cybersecurity. So to me, those are the three layers, availability, um, affordability, and adoption, the three-layer cake. Deanne, I'll turn it back over to you. Thanks, Sean. Uh, Sean, you're so good at what you do. Thank you so much. Sean's going to be on. Please stay on. We've got an an Ask Me Anything with Sean coming up after this portion. So what is broadband infrastructure in Texas? Um, Broadband infrastructure in Texas is all three of all of the above, which Sean just mentioned. It's the current state of broadband coverage. This picture up here is from FCC.gov. I'm linking to it in the slides like usual. You know, there's maps. We refer you all to check out the FCC map so you can zoom in on Texas. I just took a screenshot of like some of the, you know, the data sets are available. So that's what broadband infrastructure in Texas. It's the current state of coverage in Texas. What is available? Uh, the access disparities across rural and urban communities and the access disparity uh, could, could mean different things. Could mean different things, right? Like lack of the device, lack of the you know internet access, lack of the skill and confidence to use both of them, and then the challenges and opportunities for expansion and solutions and problems, which the TDOP you know is uh, very much focused on. All of that is infrastructure. So when someone thinks says that like uh, they hear a conversation about broadband infrastructure and that they shouldn't be participating in those conversations, like. Broadband infrastructure as a whole includes all of us who intersect, who do this work. Like one does not exist without the other. And we'll go into that a little bit more in a little bit. Next slide. We always want to be referring you all back to the TDOP's five goals. If there are still uh, looming questions about what types of solutions you should be designing or proposing or thinking about in your community, you can always refer to the five goals from the TDOP plan because it adheres to the NTIA measurable objectives. So those are the objectives. Those are the outcomes we're trying to reach with the goals on the right side of the column. We will know that we are tracking towards success if we can see the North Star light at the end of the tunnel with these goals. Next slide. Page 48 was a reminder if like if you're not sure where to find um, a much more in detailed um, description of the outcomes and the goals and uh, how the how the the objectives will be measured is remember that the key performance indicators is the quantifiable measure of performance that will be used. KPIs is its own PowerPoint presentation in its own. So we just want to make sure that if you want to see if your um, if your KPI relates to the four core strategies, page 48 of the TDOP is where you can find that information. And so you should be designing your inputs and your outputs of your solutions that will um, that will work in alignment with the KPIs and the goals and the objectives of the plan. Next slide. So how do you how do you know that it's going to be an, an effective program um, within the within the within the digital operating goals? The the BDO has developed there are multiple KPIs that will guide the program's effectiveness over the next coming years, but it will be based on this model that we have to use with the NTIAs um, with the NTIAs guidance, also on page forty eight. Thank you. 
Um, so key components about funding in Texas that uh, we, people should be um, figuring out is understanding the TDOT funding sources, that all of this is, um, you know, is still a work in progress. Uh, there are different ways that the community can be working together to decide whether or not the TDOT funding sources are going to be applicable to them, if they're going to meet those, those guidelines. I will note that, like, one of the things that's coming up here in Texas and also across geographies is that we we can't ex expect for uh, TDOT funding or state funding or federal funding to be 100% um, able to cover like all of the um, gaps in access or programming that a state the size of Texas has. So you want to also be keeping an eye on also the, the current federal, state, and local funding initiatives that exist and the ones that are forming. So the ones that are underway and the ones that are forming. Um, consider public-private partnerships. Um, think uh, think about models that are outside of the for-profit, non-profit models. Like I've, I see a lot of um, I see a lot of solutions being designed that are all for-profit or all non-profit. Um, I think the public-private partnership term can get kind of wonky, but just seriously be considering like what, like the more people that get involved in designing a solution together, as I said, the former presentation, the more the community builds it together, the more they protect it together, the more they carry it across, you know, the finish line and spike the, you know, you know, spike the ball, as we would say in Texas football. And consider, um, and consider asking other public-private partners in your community to consider making digital inclusion investments we're not going to go over, you know, CRA credits, you know, Community Reinvestment Act credits that has to do with the, you know, with the banking community, but consider asking or working with other sectors to also make digital inclusion um, investments. Um, an, an example that I, I talk about often is like pulling together a certain set of funders that have, an, a, you know, who they're, uh, whether they work on housing or food insecurity whether or not you know they have bandwidth uh, to make digital inclusion investments because they're the you know they're some of the communities that are most impacted by this issue. Excuse me. Next slide. Tips for considering funding implementation and roadmap. Um, these are the four that the BDO anticipates to fund the four primary strategies to address the needs in Texas. Uh, these haven't changed since the last time we talked about this slide, but that what has changed is the public comment period has passed, which means that these could change based on public feedback and public comments, but it, you should be making sure that these are the four that are top of mind um, as we get closer um, to the funding and, and the guidelines of what that capacity grant pro uh, program making looks like. Next slide. Um, uh, the capacity grant funding structure is still being formed. The guidelines are still being determined and the NTIA anticipates releasing um, the NOFO um, to the state in Q2 2024. From there, states will build their grant programs. Next slide. Here, these are the concepts that can be funded by the Texas Digital Opportunity um, Program plans, capacity grants, training and device programs, initiatives to offset costs, and continued engagement and collaboration. So you want to be, uh, they put a note here, watch for announcements on video grants and programs later this year. Also, um, this slide I wanted to tell um set a reminder for you all that some there are people in this space who have been doing this work for quite a long time. It's always been a space that has needed more people and more resources. Definitely be working on a solution for your community if there isn't one, but you should also be reaching out to folks who have been doing this work in the field for years for the advice and technical assistance um, that is currently already readily available. Um, and then if they don't have the information, they'll help you find those resources. And if you are in a community where there are some programs that are already underway or have a history of doing this work, consider working with them, supporting them, and uplifting their work um, before starting a new program on your own. Um, there are lots of people often when a, there is a waterfall of funding like this that enters local communities that, that parachute in and enter through this space um, and some of those programs um, sometimes are not that successful because they don't have a history of doing them or they didn't take the time to map out the stakeholders in their ecosystem. Next slide. So uh, 
Leveraging some of the funding in the meantime, there are lots of things that be, can be going on and standing up right now in your community. To, uh, leveraging funding for digital opportunity initiatives to go out and seek out what programs are currently being um, that are currently available, whether it's public and private funding. Specifically, there are lots of um, there are lots of foundations and companies that have earmarked what they call pandemic recovery funding for local communities. So it's not necessarily going to be uh, marketed as digital inclusion, digital divide, digital equity work. So take advantage of the time that you have right now. Uh, you could, it doesn't have to be all funding from one source. Consider bringing funding from uh, maybe a foundation, maybe some city funding, and then wait, we, since we don't know when the, the state funding program is, is going to begin, then you, you know it adds capacity to your programs and your proposals when you're working on them. Um, as a reminder, partner with the current statewide networks and local organizations that are already exist. Consider joining one of those state, statewide networks of local organizations and forming, forming cohorts and fo uh, focus groups. I was on a call uh, yesterday um, with someone, I don't know if she's on if she's on today, but is very much working um, with all of the stakeholders and leaders that work on housing and um, housing insecurity or, or public housing, they call themselves housers. And so they have their own un unofficial, you know, working group, they spend the time getting together, talking about how they're going to collaborate, work on solutions um, and for their community, they troubleshoot, they share resources, they share data. These, it's, it, these are um, not official you know, committees or boards that need to be formed. It's, it's very much community organizing one-on-one, -on -one, which is my suggestion for you all today is that now is a really good time for ACP transition working groups to be forming. We don't need, um, you know, the, you know, we don't need municipalities and counties to, you know, pass orders or any other type of, um, any type of government affairs to be forming ACP transition working groups. You know, you should be inviting the people that work on this issue now, the people that are most impacted when the ACP goes away to start coming in and taking on the next steps or what the forecasted next steps are going to be once the ACP funding runs out. So please consider that as a community organizing model that you could implement um, right now. Um, I will be working on a checklist with Sean. We are waiting on the FCC's um, updated information. We're watching the ACP news out of Washington uh, very closely. And so if that resource is available, um, you know, we hopefully will have that and shareable um, tool for y'all very soon, but we're waiting. Uh, consider uh, partnering with entities that are doing digital opportunity work, but may not realize it. Lots of organizations working with cover population, uh, populations offer internet and device support, but do not realize that there are re resources available to them. So maybe big organizations like San Antonio Area Food Bank might, might know about it, but there could be, uh, as I mentioned before, like churches that have food pantries or other smaller organizations that are also providing smaller, low capacity models of digital inclusion work that might not know that this um, these resources are available now or gonna be uh, available. So it's a great way and a great opportunity to bring stakeholders in, which we always wanna be doing. Next slide. So this leads me back to the ecosystem. We wanna always be coordinating entities working together in this ecosystem. If you're on this call, you're part of the ecosystem. When I ask you to help us find those um, other organizations and stakeholders is because we wanna pull them into the digital opportunity ecosystem. Because without the ecosystem, um, this ecosystem really is the, the foundation of this work. It's how we wanna work ourselves out of a job. And um, how do you know that we um, have an ecosystem? Next slide. This, oh my gosh, Ooh, this thing, this animation thing really throws me off. This is the, the checklist from the National Digital Inclusion Alliance. There, you'll know that you are working within an ecosystem if you are, you know, working on providing some of these outcomes and these solutions. Uh, I saw the chat earlier, uh, someone mentioned how technical support is often left out. I agree. Technical support, digital navigation often goes unnoticed but I can't point to a successful model that is um, that's bridging the digital divide that doesn't have a fleet of well-equipped uh, digital navigators that are working one-on-one -on -one with the community. Like these people are on the front lines. So hardware, software, technical support, digital navigation, and always uh, like my broken record, collaboration and collaboration. Collaboration meaning 
um, not just the collaboration and working together at the table to come up with your proposals or your solutions, but really collaboration like out in the community, working with the people who provide, you know, the internet service, ISPs, policymakers, advocates, um, really working together in partnership with those folks, even if those folks are not going to be providing technical assistance or grant writing or be deploying some of these programs, really hearing them out and documenting their strategies can help you, um, you know, build the trust in the community that you are going to need so that you can reach your goals. Next slide. So, uh, so success, success, um, in the ecosystem is the inspiration and learning that I just mentioned. Be, uh, be uh, talking to each other, talking to your leaders. Um, you know, I have a tool that is available that, you know, where you can practice being a spokesperson for the TDOP, meaning that like if someone comes up to you and asks you like, what is this TDOP all about and what should I know about it? Because you always want to be in inspiring um, others in the, you know, in the state of Texas and your local community to uh, join this work and know about the work of the Broadband Development Office and your work too. And you also want to be learning from one another. And then always before, um, like I said before, always be considering different funding models. What I also mean by that is upgrading your understanding of what is possible. Um, there are programs that have launched in the past when we um, when we went through BDOT. BTOP. Some were really successful and, and some were not. Uh, there was a digital, uh, the digital TV transition that, you know, happened in the early 2000s. It really taught the uh, community a lot about how hard it is to reach vulnerable communities. And we're just coming now to the tail end of the ACP enrollment process. So you can take all of those learnings and really upgrade your learnings of what is possible when you're designing your solutions. Next slide. Um, here, I'm going to invite Sean back. So today, instead of doing um, the regular breakout rooms, we are going to ask you all to stay on and we're going to dedicate this time to a broadband basics, ask me anything. We're going to pause the recordings.